Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth, where I talk to artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals. I'm Tyler, the host. And today, we have a very special guest. We have my friend, Francesca Policino. Uh, she is a video and film professional living in New York City. She's currently working as an associate producer editor with PBS. Uh, we'll get into what that means and, and her background a little bit. But the reason we know each other is because Francesca interned at Visit Savannah when I was the video guy over there. So uh, uh, first, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, like, so I probably butchered that. What is, like, what do you do with PBS? I just recently got into this role before I was doing a lot of UPM work um, and other types of work. But at PBS, I am an associate producer and editor, and I mainly work on our promos team. So, um, you know, my passion is documentaries, but this role is more cutting the teasers and the trailers for the actual documentary shows that we do. Um, so yeah, anything from our shows and then also some of our podcasts too. So I produce them as in getting, you know, all of the content, getting the rights, and then I actually edit them too. So uh, just documentary stuff though. Um, it depends. Well, so the breadth of the PBS stuff that we mostly do is documentary style, but it's a lot of the TV shows that we do. Um, but I guess you would call them documentaries or nonfiction, because I think that's mainly almost all we do. Um, and then, you know, podcasts, I'm cutting some of the cheesers for those. And then all of our, our donor stuff, I don't do quite as much, but I have done a couple things where it's like, you know, um, this wouldn't be made possible without viewers like you. Here's how you can donate and, you know, stuff like that. So some listeners uh, are not uh, film people. You said mm -hmm. UPM. Is that Unit Production Manager? Is that what that yes. is? Yes. Can, yeah. so can you explain that? Yeah. A lot of what I was doing for these shoots um, was, you know, locations, getting our crew, making sure all of our crew agreements and payments were in order, getting our equipment ready, um, really just managing our crew and making sure everything is good with where they need to be, when they need to be places, the equipment they have, the people who work for them, everything's good with the payments and a lot of negotiations. Um, and then, you know, the location agreements, um, one of the shoots we did was out on the streets of New York and it was ro with Romeo Santos, who's, you know, kind of a bigger um, deal in the music world. So it was trying to make sure we got all of those permits and having crowd control and having, you know, everything good with the New York City police so that we could shoot outside on the sidewalks without it being a hazard. Um, so getting all of those in order, you know, parking for our crew, catering for our crew, um, really kind of like the whole breadth of all of the little nitty gritty things that I think people don't know that go into a production, um, m making sure that for the day of the production, it rolls as seamlessly as possible. Um, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so not as creative of, as other roles that I've done. Um, it was very much a logistic logistics role but um super fun to be able to be on those shoots i did one with alicia keys and that was like the highlight of um my winter probably of my career so far um but not as creative as other roles within film and television but definitely an essential um and kind of irritating at times because you do have to do those little nitty-gritty things that people don't necessarily think about that go into like how is our crew gonna have a bathroom if we're shooting outside you know like random stuff like that that i don't think you necessarily think about uh you said you came from a non-union background is it basically mm -hmm. like I, I the way i understand it like a production will be either like a union production or a non-union like they a non-union production can't hire union employees and so like d is that a choice you made or when you said you came from that background like i mean why 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 are you non-union and and what's the advantage i guess non-union for me i was just moving around so much um my role has really changed a lot because you know two years ago i was an intern when i moved to new york then I was an associate producer. I've done some UPM work. I've done some first AD work. I've done, now I'm an associate producer and now I edit, which 
I never, I, you know, never say never, but I never thought I would be an editor. Um, so I think for me, I just had a lot of, a lot of different roles and I've wanted to keep it really fluid with that. And within the union, you have to have a certain number of hours you know, you really have to be like, if you want to join the union, you like have to put in a lot of work to be able to do that. And I think for me, I've just had so many different roles. Like I have friends who are grips and gaffers and that's like all they do. And like every week they're doing like 60 hours on set. So it's like easy for them to be able to do that. And that's, that is their life. For me, I just wanted to do all of these different roles and I kind of not stumbled into these roles, but it never was like a clear path for me. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why I didn't join the union was because um, I just got into these other roles. And I think a lot of them, they've been non-union roles just by, not by chance, but um, they just haven't needed that. I know at PBS, we do have union editors. And that was one of the things when I, um, join this job i was like oh my gosh am i gonna have to join the union and they're like not for this role because it's technically a producer editor role but our all of our other editors the ones that i work with are in the union but again that's their like they've been working at pbs for 30 years i mean mm -hmm. they that's like their life i'm not quite sure if i want to be and i want to be a producer i want to be a nonfiction producer and director so for me i'm like i don't think i would join an editing union because i know i don't want to edit for pbs for like 30 years i want to produce for them i want to direct and i want to do documentaries and i feel like in a documentary world too you don't necessarily see as many people in the union you see a lot on tv shows um like almost all the TV shows that I know that people work on are in the union, but like for documentaries, you don't necessarily need that. So yeah, sorry, we, that was such a long answer. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's good. And for, I mean, and, and, and I know I don't actually, some of the lingo you're saying is going a little bit over my head, but like, I understand okay. most, but like some people, like we were talking a couple weeks ago when I was on an, on a shoot and I was the, uh, like the grip, I was the lighting guy. I was doing the sound. I was the shooter editor, wrote the script. So like, I'm very much on the indie side of, yeah. of production and filmmaking. Um, but I, I am like you still kind of figuring out like what it is I want to do mm -hmm. with the camera. Um, but so like the fact that you're clear on you want to be in production versus post-production, I think is awesome that you're like, you've already like said, like, I want to do production stuff. Um, but do you think like, since you are editing now and, and I know you have a history of editing too. You, when you worked with me, you did a lot of editing then as well. Do you think it's like useful for somebody who wants to get into production to do some post-production? Because when I interviewed for this role, it specifically set a producer role and me coming from the world of producing, you know, thought it was going to be very much a producer role. And then I get into my interviews and they're like, Oh, you're going to have to take an editing test. And I'm kind of venting to her about it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to take an editing test, like, but this is a producer job. And she's like, honestly, though, all the jobs I've seen lately for, especially in the doc world, and I think it's very much different in the doc world, um, an independent world, is they want producers who are able to do both. Um, and it's really important because um, you look at PBS, which is like, all state funded and all private funded. So the budget is very, very small. So it is, even though it's PBS and everyone thinks it's so big, it's still kind of feels like the indie world because your budgets are constrained by the state or constrained by private donors. You have to, you know, the budgets are really small. So they want a producer who's able to do both. Um, I've seen a lot of that when I was looking for jobs back in November when I was freelancing with like places like now this and even vice places that have um you know are more news focused they want you to be able to do both um and my friend kind of said the same thing about the documentary places she's been working at um and i do feel like i didn't know a ton of post lingo post production lingo before and i, I still kind of don't but i feel like i'm learning so much that will help me as a producer 
Um, just being able to talk to your editor. I mean, the same reason why I took some cinematography classes when I was in college, even though I knew I never wanted to be a cinematographer, I was like, I want to be able to speak their language a little bit. I mean, not that I know every single thing in the cinematography world, but I have a basic knowledge and I have an appreciation for it. Um, and I also feel like your appreciation changes. Like I always appreciated my editors, but now that I am into it, I can start to think of things and be considerate of what they would need. Same with when I took cinematography classes, I was like, oh, here's something that I know as a cinematographer I would want. So as a producer, I'm going to make sure that we're aware of this. Um, so I think if anything, as a producer or as a director, being able to teach yourself just the basics mm -hmm. of the different parts of production, if anything, just helps you be more aware and also just gives you an appreciation of like how much these your other teammates work. Sure. Stuff. Let's take a step back. You grew up in Ohio, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Your question how, how did, that you ask. Yeah. How did how did you end up how did you end up in Savannah and uh, yeah. Like how, yeah. what did that look like when you were, when you were a kid, like what was your first spark and how'd you end up going to Savannah first? I grew up 45 minutes North of Columbus, Ohio, which is the capital, um, in Ohio state, which is one of the largest, if not the largest university in America. But I grew up in a very rural part of Ohio where everyone had horse farms. Um, I actually grew up on a horse farm, but everyone was farming. It was a super small school. Um, and I was kind of always like the weird art kid. Um, you know, everyone was so into sports and so into farming. And I just wanted to be in theater and perform and do art stuff and make weird little videos. And I think it like very, I very much stuck out. Um, so I knew from a lot of an early age that I wanted to move, that I didn't want to stay. Um, and that once I moved, I never would want to go back, which sounds really bad, but um, yeah. So I think from an early age, I just got really into theater. I mean, I was, I was, my brother and I would put on shows when we were like three. There's like videos of us like dressing up and putting on shows. Um, and I think my parents and my whole family were just super about that. Um, my dad is a huge, huge film buff. I mean, my entire life, he just, my entire life growing up was basically my dad quoting movies to the point where like, I don't even know if certain things are actually just quotes from movies or if it's like real life, it's kind of a weird um, mix. I will see a movie and I'm like, wait a minute, that's what that what dad was referring to. I just thought that was like some little m thing he made up, but it's actually from this movie like years later. So my dad, I remember he bought me this little um, how to write a screenplay. Um, and we would go to coffee shops and we would work on a screenplay that we were going to write. Um, but at that time, I was still really into theater. And then I took a photography class my senior year of high school. And I got so into photography. And by then, I was already taking like every other art class I could at this random rural high school where there weren't a lot of art classes. But any art class I could get my hands on, um, I would take. And I realized I was like, wait, I really love acting but I also really love photography how can I mesh these two together I could be a filmmaker and I could direct actors and also be working with the DP or the cinematographer and I can actually merge the the best of both worlds um so anyways I looked at a bunch of colleges I applied to NYU I applied to CalArts I didn't get into any of them <laughs> couldn't have even afforded any of them, even if I did get into them. Um, and I visited Savannah on St. Patrick's Day. Um, actually, SCAD came to our school and they were like, you should come to SCAD. And I was like, oh, this is actually interesting. And I looked them up and they had an amazing film program. So it was like, well, I've been to New York. I've been out to California. You know, I didn't get into either of those schools. Maybe I'll go see what Savannah's about. And of course, I went on St. Patrick's Day. So like, I 
got very drunk um <laughs> and i was like 18 but like people were giving me alcohol oh, which i don't know that? if you're gonna <laughs> yeah i don't know okay so That's we'll funny. cut all of that <laughs> But yeah, I went with like two of my best friends. We did a road trip down to Savannah and um, it was just so fun. And the city is just gorgeous. And yeah. I fell in love with it. I mean, I fell in love with the city. And there is no my campus. Whole... Savannah is the campus for scale. Right. Yeah. And like, I think I grew up so like Ohio State is like, it's an undeniable campus. I mean, everywhere you go, it's like Ohio State. And I feel like I just didn't want that. I didn't want to frat. I mean, by then I was so focused on like, this is what I want to do. I want to be a filmmaker. Like, I want to go to a serious school. I don't want to party. I don't want to mess around. Like, I'm not going to college to be in a, in a frat or, or a sorority or party. Like, I'm going to college because I want to be a filmmaker. And like, if I'm going to spend that much money, um, I'm going to do it right. Um, so yeah, so I ended up going down to Savannah. Um, and it was, it was such a good decision. I mean, I know people, there's a whole thing about whether you should go to film school or not. And I see like, yeah, I see a lot of friends who aren't successful. I see a lot of friends who are incredibly successful. And I think it really is just how you, what you do with what you have. Um, and if you're going to go to film school, especially what I loved about Scott is like, they connect you like they have so many networking opportunities. And I took every single one of those. I mean, I was not afraid to go up to they had Oscar award win winning filmmakers. And I was not afraid to just go up to them and be like, hi, <laughs> like, here's my card. Is there a way I can intern for you? And I, I never interned for any Oscar award winning filmmakers, but I got like, I think I did like six internships while I was at SCAD. I mean, like, I was just not afraid to go up to people. And I think that's like, if you're going to spend money to go to film school and you're going to make that commitment where you're working that much on these little project, little projects, I mean, just any projects, like take advantage of the networking. And I think that's like what I see with my friends that kind of sets my friends who are really successful apart from my friends who aren't. It's like the just fearlessness mm. and the like here's an opportunity here's a connection here's a person like let's go for it and i think also a sense of genuineness like yeah we all want jobs but also like i'm just genuinely interested in connecting with people and i think that also sets it apart as you see the way sometimes people approach you know people in the industry and it seems very much like oh we're just here to network but if you go up to people and you really ask, like, why they love what they're doing, you know, what you and I are doing, like talking mm -hmm. to each other and having a genuine conversation, I feel like that'll get you so much further, too. So this is a step back, but writing, so a, screen, writing a screenplay as a kid is, a, is kind of an odd thing. What does your dad do? We never... <laughs> so my dad sells medical supplies. He has always wanted to be a filmmaker. I mean, I think that's like what he's always wanted to do. And he says, so he's partially retired right now. And he says when he does his full retirement, he wants to be a grip. Really? Because <laughs> he's very, he used to be a bodybuilder. So he's very good at put, picking things up and putting them down. Sure. And he, the he, Name of the game. And he, you're right. And he, he loves movie sets and he doesn't know like a lot about, writing or directing or any of that but he's like if i can just be on a movie set as a grip like i would love that so he always says he's gonna be a grip when he retires um but yeah i don't know he's just a huge i mean i'll go on to our voodoo account and he has 300 movies that he's purchased not to mention all of the dvds and vhs's that we have at home and all of the other movie subscription services he just like loves movies and i think he has an appreciation for cinema and like the actual art of it like he'll watch you know like the behind the scenes well, how and the do, bloopers how, how does it react when you tell him hey dad i'm going to work for vice or hey i'm going now i'm working oh for my PBS, god or... well that's the thing when i wanted to go to film school i mean he was like so just 
excited he like you know some parents are like i don't want my kid to go to art school you know because like how are they gonna make a career out of art school my dad was like so ecstatic i mean i think both my parents were like oh my god like all we've ever done is invest so much money into your theater classes and your cameras and like why would you not um so uh, i think uh, he's like so excited whenever I have, whenever I get these jobs. I mean, they, it's a little overwhelming where like I'll go home and my parents have so many questions for me. And I'm just like, I don't want to talk about work and the business. And my, my mom's like, what's a first AD do? What's a first AC? What's this? What's that? And it's cute. But other times I'm just like, it's my winter break. I just want to like, I get that all the time. Um, where's your camera? I'm like, where's your spreadsheet? You know, I'm like off the job right now kind of thing. I know. They're like always trying to get me to make documentaries. Like my grandpa's like, you can make a documentary about me. And I'm like. It's funny you say that because I'm doing that actually about my right. grandfather. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen the movie Dick Johnson is Dead? Or uh, let's see, what's it called? Watch. Yeah. Dick Johnson is Dead. It's on Netflix. No, you should. Uh, it's just it's a it's a filmmaker in New York City and her f- elderly father has dementia and he's uh, going to, you know, be passing away eventually. So she decides to just make a movie with him about his death and all the different, you know, he might fall down a flight of stairs. He might get hit by a bus. So it's like the kind of this like cathartic release. But it's so cute because like the old man is just so happy to you know, be working alongside his daughter and like be a part of, you know, her life and her career. And, and I mean, it's, there's, there's sad moments in it, but overall, I think that you would definitely get into that. And I, I, uh, I think it's super cool that your dad, your parents, both your parents are so supportive. Why not, why not do, um, acting like as, as the main thing? So acting was actually my minor. Um, again, I think it was just like, I was like, Oh my God, like, I never even thought to make movies like I could direct the actors and I could, you know, be behind the camera and learning about cinematography. And I think I just fell in love with all of that. And I think film school really solidified that when I started taking cinematography classes and lighting classes and directing actor classes. And I was just like, I love this so much more than any of the acting classes I took. Um, Also, it's that level of cringe i feel like where you know you and i were talking about this before i'm like when i have to um record scratch tracks and i hear my own voice i'm just like oh like i think if i were an actor i would be like a johnny depp type actor where he like i don't know if this is true but this is like the the rumor is that he's never gone to any of his actual films because Uh he doesn't like to see himself on screen and as an actor, I don't think that's like a good practice to have. And I think I would be that type of actor where I would be so cringe. I would not like, I would be so cringed out about myself. I would not want to see myself on screen. Yeah. Um, I think there's a healthy balance. But, Cause, cause uh, if you're like, if you're like, Oh wow, I'm the, I'm the highlight of this movie. Then maybe that's like a little bit too far the other way. But yeah, I think everyone has kind of this like healthy, like, well, not, it's very normal to not like your voice or like like how you look in pictures because mm-hmm. we just see we perceive ourselves differently than like the the rest of the world, you know. But everyone, the way I see you and the way I hear your voice is how everyone else hears you and sees you, you know. So it's like only unique to us, basically. Yeah, I also think like a lot of uh, just actors have a tough life, and that is like definitely again <laughs> the appreciation thing. <laughs> The appreciation thing that I like learned through taking directing actors classes and through working with actors is like, they really like, I mean, the, um, I mean, the amount of auditions that they have to do and half the time, I mean, 75% of the time they don't even get the role and like not being like being an amazing actor, but not being the right look for the role. I think and then just having to keep up your physical appearance so much and then even being able to keep it up and people again being like that's not the right look for the role um i feel like it's just so hard and people don't realize like how much actors just get rejected all the time and i think that level of rejection um you have to be such a strong person to be able to do that um 
Yeah, and the people yeah. that we know, like the the household names, they're like a very small selection of like yeah. a huge, massive pool of people who are out there trying to make it for sure. Yeah. Why why um, do, why documentary and not narrative? Yeah, so that's another good question. Well, so the thing is, I still actually do on the side. Um, I'm producing a couple of narratives for my some coworkers. Um, I'm trying to do a music video, like actually direct one, um, but I've never directed a music video before. So it's becoming um, kind of a, a process. Um, but I they think- They get expensive fast. So yeah. Yeah. And like, also, I'm just like, oh, my God, I've never directed a music video. Like, what am I doing? I've I've directed a few docs. So I'm kind of and, you know, like, that's just my life. Like, I watch hours and hours and hours when I'm editing and producing these. And, you know, I worked for Vice before this. So it's like um, I'm like used to the doc world, whereas like, yeah, music videos. I'm like, I have no idea. I just want to I want to direct one for fun. Um, but I don't know what I'm doing. So I need to like, actually, like, go back at like everything I've been taught and really like, really focus. Um, but I guess with documentaries, yeah. So it's like, that click moment when I was like, I want to make films. And then I went to film school. And um, I took a couple like directing the documentary class. Um, directing environmental film documentaries and I think I just really fell in love and I realized that um for me it's just something much easier I can write a documentary I can find a subject um kind of goes back to my childhood where my parents when they had me they were like oh my god she has questions like as a baby I was just like so interested in everything and growing up i just had questions about everything and like i still do i just want to know how things work i want to know why people think the way they do or why they do what they do like i just have all these questions all the time and i love filmmaking so why would i not ask these questions while i'm filmmaking it was kind of just like that click moment and i remember like the first doc I worked on, it was um, actually how I met my boyfriend. Um, it was his roommate. It was like a super shitty documentary that we made in art school um, about his roommate who's a painter. And I just remember sitting with this painter all day asking him these questions. And I'm like, I could do this all day, just sit with this guy. Like, I love just sitting and talking to people and interviewing them. Um, and I feel like it just connects you. I. I just love having that connection with people, especially people that you don't know that well. Cause I feel like, you know, you can make documentaries on your grandpa and that connects you with him in such a bigger level. But then you also make documentaries on these complete strangers and you're like in these strangers homes and sitting with them for hours. And there's just something really beautiful. I think about that. Um, so yeah, I think that's when I was like, I want to do documentaries. Um, I also have this thing where I used to write a lot narratives and now I feel like everything I write has been something that's already been done. It's kind of like that complex. And I know that's, I know that's not true. There's fresh ideas, but for me, I just can't seem to think of something that I'm like, oh, wait, this is kind of very similar to this story. Whereas like documentaries, I'm like, there are what, seven, almost eight billion people in the world? There's, and then not even about people, about corporations, about the environment. I mean, there's just a million things you can make. Yeah, and it's that are I mean, nonfiction. Life is stranger than fiction. I mean, there's so many. I mean, walk around New York City for five minutes, and you'll see so many people where you're like, "What is your deal?" You know. So, yeah. You, and, and any of them could have a movie made about their life, and, and I mean, that's what's cool about the podcast is just all we're really getting is like a little slice of somebody's life. But people have such different interests and backgrounds, and but I mean, and yet we're all like united by certain things like i think I, I think everyone's creative and we all you know have families and aspirations and um so yeah it's i i'm i'm too drawn to it can you tell us a little bit about the documentary that you're working on now yeah so um like i said um i'm working on like i'm always working on projects on the side of my um 
you know, 40 hours a week that I work doing films. I'm also always working on films that I don't get paid for, unfortunately, but it's, it's like the life of an artist, you know? Um, so I'm working on a couple of narrative fe features, just a, associate producing them for friends. Um, I'm trying to direct a music video. And then the big thing that I've been working on that I was talking to you about, which is a documentary over the past, we shot it like two years ago. Um, and I'm producing it, and then my friend is directing it. It is a documentary on the first radio station in America to play the Beatles. And um, not necessarily about the Beatles, but it's about the whole rock revolution of the 60s within radio and the radio personalities that kind of fed that revolution and how that changed society. And just radio in general, because after that rock revolution, radio really took a turn um, with totally new formats. Um, so the director that I'm working with, his uncle was actually one of the first radio DJs to play the Beatles, to interview them, um, and to interview a lot of these big names in rock like Sonny and Cher and um, who else? tons of others um his name is ron riley so it is the story of wls which is the radio station it, they are in chicago um it's am radio and it's the story of wls in the 1960s during the rock revolution and british invasion as told by ron riley who is one of the last remaining djs from the 1960s is he from still the working? whole rock revolution. No, 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 no. He's okay. 90. Okay. Um, he is so 90. You shot it two years ago. What needs to happen to get this thing out? Yeah. So we shot the first half two years ago. Um, and then, uh, so originally the film was just going to be on Ryan Riley. It was just going to be like a short little um, kind of, what is it? Like profile piece. Mm -hmm. Um so we have like hours and hours and hours of interview footage. But as we're going through this, we're realizing that it isn't just a film about Ron Riley. It needs to be a film about the station and about the impact that it had. Um, so then we're like, oh my gosh, we need to interview like the historian for the station and we need to go to the actual station and get B-roll and that's in Chicago. Um, so like the past two years have been us trying to cobble together an edit. We've had a couple of different editors, um, you know, a lot of things happening. I moved, our director moved, our editor moved, just a lot of things where the post process was not super seamless, but we got about a 30 minute edit in and we're like, this needs more breath. Like this needs to be something bigger than just a profile piece. So that's kind of where we got was like, who do we need to interview to make this an actual documentary about WLS? Where do we need to go? What type of B-roll? And then we realized all of that is going to be quite a bit more money, um, you know, because I live in New York. Our director lives in Atlanta. Um, our DP lives in New York. So it's like, how do we get everyone to Chicago? How do we get all of our, you know, equipment and all of that? So um, we are in the next stages of trying to find funding for it. Gotcha. So m more production to take place. Is there a official title or a working title? And how can people maybe uh, find out more and support this production? Yeah. So the the working title is Riley because Ron Riley is the DJ. And again, this was going to be a documentary just on Ron Riley. But now it's more of a documentary about kind of that topic as told by Ron Riley. So the title might change. I'll, and I'll link to the social medias. I always say that, but I, I will I will actually do it in the description. Yeah. If you're if you're listening, you. if you're listening to this, you can watch this on YouTube, and there'll be the links that below, or I'll tr maybe include them in the pod in the podcast description as well. But uh, okay, after you graduated uh, with mm -hmm. your film degree from SCAD, why New York City and why not LA or why yeah. not back to Ohio or why not somewhere <laughs> else? You know, like why why New York? Yeah, so I graduated in 2020, um, right after I finished my internship, actually, with you. I think it was like very much, I was doing stuff for you in December, and then I um, graduated in March of 2020, dead of the pandemic. Um, I actually had an internship in New York, um, 
And that ended up not happening because the whole world shut down. Um, and I had a couple things I was working on in Savannah that ended up not panning out because of the pandemic. And my parents were like, listen, we can't, um, they were helping me with where I was living in Savannah. And they were like, if you don't have a job, like you're going to need to come and move back with us. And I was like, okay. So I moved back to Ohio right after I graduated. Um, and yeah, it was really hard because again, we were like in total lockdown. Um, I ended up working for an animal shelter because, you know, restaurants weren't open, retail wasn't open, but people had pets. Um, and that didn't go away because of the pandemic. And actually people got more pets because they were lonely. So I ended up working for an animal shelter because I just loved animals. Um, but it was depressing. Like I was living in Ohio. I wanted to be working in film. I got a couple PA gigs on like a big lots commercial, which was super cool. But again, nothing was like panning out because people just weren't shooting. Um, and so for a whole year, I worked at this animal shelter. I lived with my parents at home um, and I ended up actually getting an internship. It was unpaid and it was virtual and it was at a talent agency here in New York. Um, and it was through one of my friends who worked in the same office. She was an editor, but the editing house that she worked at shared the same office with this talent agency. And when I say talent agency, it wasn't like your typical, like, oh, we represent these actors. They specifically represented directors and editors, which was super cool because that's what I wanted. I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I was like, well, I'm not doing anything in Ohio. Like, might as well do a virtual unpaid internship, like, on my days off of working. I mean, it was like a couple of days a week. It wasn't, like, strenuous. And I had nothing else going on and I was like, I need to make connections. Um, so I started working there and then um, it had been a year since I was living and I was just like living in Ohio. And I'm like, I'm just going to make the leap. Like I have always wanted to live in New York. Um, you know, I thought about LA. I thought about Atlanta. The reason I didn't do LA was because a, I've been to LA a couple of times and I just don't like it. And I've been in New York and I've just always wanted to live here and always seen myself living here. Um, B, most of my friends from SCAD either went to Atlanta or went to New York. And I only have maybe one or two friends from SCAD who went to LA. And I was like, I wanna go where I have friends who have jobs, who can get me jobs. Um, and then also I was working, I was interning at this place and you know, I like, was talking to them and I'm like well I think I'm gonna move to New York and they're like we can help you with as many connections as possible um we will try to get you a job in New York I mean obviously not a guarantee but we'll help you as much as we can so I was like okay I don't have a job I have an unpaid internship I have a ton of money saved up from working because I literally just saved all my money up um, I'm like, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to move to New York. I got a random roommate that I met online and it was so scary. It was terrifying. I didn't think I was like, I'm going to end up like homeless, <laughs> um, or I'm going to end up having to move back to Ohio. But, um, it ended up working out because right after I moved, my boss ended up quitting and they needed to hire someone at this agency. And they were like, well, you've interned for us for a year. Like, we'll give you a job. And I was just like, awesome. that's what that's what happens when you take leaps. Um, so yeah, that's why I moved to New York um, and it worked out. And my random roommate actually ended up being so lovely. I mean, you hear all the horror stories. Um, her and I are still friends. So it just worked out. And again, it was terrifying. I mean, I, <laughs> I was like, what if this doesn't work out? Like, oh my God. Um, the, also, the reason I didn't move to Atlanta, even though I did have a lot of friends in Atlanta, was just because um, my boyfriend, when we were in college, he interned a lot in Atlanta. So I would go to Atlanta a lot. Um, like all the time, I was constantly in Atlanta because that's where he was living. And I was just like, I want to move to New York. Like I've done Atlanta. Like I kind of get the gist. I want to go somewhere that I've never really lived before. Um, 
Also, Andrew, not to say I moved someplace for a boy because I didn't. Um, but Andrew was living in Jersey and we had done the whole year of me being in Ohio and him being in Jersey and it was exhausting. <laughs> it was so mentally taxing on our relationship. And like, at that point we had been dating for three years. Like I knew we were going to keep dating. Like he wasn't a random boy. So, um, he still lived like three hours away from New York, but it's much easier than the 11 hour commute from Ohio to Jersey. So, and I think I also wanted some someone I was like if I'm gonna be alone in a city it would be nice not only to have all my friends who live in New York from SCAD but it would also be nice for my boyfriend to come up every weekend so I don't feel as alone and he's in a similar field too right he does UX design okay so yeah and now we live together he did go to SCAD we met at SCAD um Yeah, St. Patrick's Day was our anniversary. Um, the the St. Patrick's Day when you visited, or a, a different one? Um, yeah, a different one when okay. we went to SCAD. After yeah. you were going there, after you decided to go to SCAD and everything else. So we paid you, right? Visit Savannah. Visit Savannah paid me. Yeah. Okay, good. How did how did you hear about that one? I was looking at internships, and I actually saw the Visit Savannah one, and I applied, and then I saw one for the Savannah film commission and i applied to that and i actually interviewed for both um and i'm gonna be honest the song's actually really bad um but visit savannah paid and the film commission did not so i think that was like a huge thing i mean yeah Um, when you're sure yeah i was like well i need like a paid job and then also like i don't know i met with you and i met with lauren and i think like the vibes were just not that the vibes at the film commission were off but like it just felt like the type of stuff we would be doing is production stuff and the film commission i think was very much like oh you gotta learn a lot but it's a lot of paperwork and like which is fine you learn so much through that but you were like we gotta go to tyvee and we gotta shoot awesome things and you know at the time you know, I really wanted to be a, like in the field, which I mean, I still really like being in the field. Like I just love being out and shooting things. Even if I'm not the cinematographer, even if I'm just the producer on set, like I just love being out in production. Um, I still do. So I think like that was one of the things where I was like, oh my gosh, like I'll get to learn stuff. I mean, you are fairly young. I think you're only like, you're maybe like eight years older than me. But like, to me, I feel like I work with a lot of people who are like 50, 60. So I think having someone who is like less than 10 years older than me also felt really nice. Cause I felt like I could learn a lot from you, but like we could kind of speak the same language. Like it, it didn't feel like I would be being like talked down to. Right. Like I felt like I, it would be I like- I tried um, to do that as much as possible. It was so fun. Oh my gosh! Well, it one was thing, like one thing I remember you saying when you first started, you're like, "Yeah, we'll get our, uh, we'll get like." You were talking about like having a basically a a production team, and I was like, "Well, actually, that's you. <laughs> like, you're gonna be the one going to that hotel with the camera, like knocking on the door and like, hey, 'Hey, I'm from Visit Savannah. Can I shoot this thing?'" And then like after you shoot it, like you're gonna put it together too. So, which is like mostly how I operate. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that was like a little different than what you were used to doing. but Yeah, because I thought like I didn't realize that I thought like, oh, yeah, we would have a production team. But it was actually so good because so much of the doc world, like you are doing that. You are like run and gunning. I mean, not at PBS. I don't do that. But like I'm mostly behind the scenes right now. But I mean, so much of like other places I've worked at, you know, as a UPM for Apple Music, I had to go to places and be like, hi, we're filming on the street. Here's this. And like, hi, we're filming on the street. Do you mind if I like take a photo with my iPhone just so I can see the end? Like all of that, just basic skills that I think, you know, as a filmmaker, as an indie filmmaker, you have to know how to do. And people can be really shy about that. And I think I was at first and you're like, nope, you just got to go out there. Um, And I think I was met with so much, like the people of Savannah and even the people in New York are so nice about it. And they're like, oh, what film production are you working on? And so welcoming. And 
you don't think that's going to happen. And I'm sure there are instances where it doesn't, but I think I was so afraid of like, people are just going to shut me down or like threaten to call the cops. And like, no one was like that. Everyone was like, yeah, you can shoot here. Like, what are you doing? What is this about? And I think that really helped shape me with a lot of confidence. Um, I remember us talking when you did my performance review and you were like, you're like, I think the biggest thing you can work on is just like having that confidence. But I think that's something that Visit Savannah and working with you really helped me to have because before that, I wasn't used to just like going and having to talk to people. It comes Um, with time, yeah. 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 And it actually really helped me because when I worked at Vice, I was doing a lot of um, BTS or behind the scenes. And I had to like shoot with the camera and go up and interview our subjects. And I, I was like this. I feel like I've done this before. Like it felt really natural. So I think it has helped me so much in my career. Um I'm a big proponent of internships. I mean, I've done some unpaid ones, which I, I will always say like, if you can get paid, you should. I believe overall internships should pay, but um, I think whether you, whether they pay or not, I think internships are such great opportunities. I mean, to network, to learn things. Um, it also depends on the person. I've been really lucky and just had really great mentors. Um, I will say like you were one of my first mentors and like definitely one of the best. Um, and we can get into that after the podcast because it was such a great experience. And I think anyone who's listening who might be a student or might be early in their careers, like take that internship, just take the initiative, no matter what, don't be afraid to ask for an internship. Don't be afraid to like give people your card. Like you will learn so much from just sitting and talking to people. Yeah. Um, Sorry, was, that was my little nugget. <laughs> no, that's great. It's great, solid advice. I was going to say the thing about the camera is, uh, which is right uh, there. Uh, <laughs> uh, it is kind of like this social tool where it's great that you can actually use it as a way to talk to people where you'd be like a yeah. weird, weirdo for just going up and talking to them. But then also it's a good way to like get out of stuff because like you could be stuck in a weird conversation and be like, I got to go, I got to go do a lap. I got to go take like some pictures kind of thing. So like I've, I found that the camera is like a really great, I use it like a a social tool to like get in and Mm -hmm. out of conversations that otherwise I'd never have. So that is like a nice thing about, you know, being a photographer, you know, run and gun camera person, whatever. Um, last kind of like thing, uh, we're, we've both done W2 video, videography slash filmmaking slash stuff in the creative realm versus freelance. Like what do you maybe like about one over the other? Or like do you, do you tend to lean towards W2, like full-time stuff? Uh, I, yeah. Um, that's not necessarily a creative choice. I think that's more of just um, a personal thing with liking to know when my income is coming. Um, I think especially because I am fairly still new to New York. I mean, this will be my, I've lived here officially for two years. So I'm going on like my third year of living here. So I still, you know, I have a good community, but it's not like as robust as people who have been working here. I mean, I have senior producers who are freelance and they love freelancing, but they've been doing this for 20 years. So they can pick up a job like that. Um, I can't. Um, I worked at, like I worked at my um, internship that I got the job and then immediately after got the job at Vice and then didn't start freelancing really until um, about August of this year. And it was like August to December, I was freelancing and I, you know, wasn't sure when my next paycheck would come. And I think living in New York, it's really hard because everything is so expensive here. Like it's just, it's expensive. I mean, you get paid really well on productions. I will say that the thing about freelancing is my rate could be a lot higher but it had to be because I wasn't sure when my next um, paycheck would be. I think also freelancing, I got to do some really cool jobs. Like I got to do an Alicia Keys shoot. I got to do some Twitch and Amazon studios that I first AD'd on. So like, that was the thing too, is like, I didn't just have to be a producer. I could be like an assistant director. I could be a unit production manager. I could be a coordinator. Like it was cool. Cause I got to like play a lot of different roles. Um, But for me, 
I just really love the stability. Um, and you know, who's to say like a year, like a year from now, maybe I'll want to freelance again. Um, I'm on a contract with PBS right now. So maybe my hope is that it'll be extended or I'll like get to go to a different section of PBS. So who's to say by the summer, I might be freelancing again, but just for me, I like also, I like working for a company where I can make connections within the company. I feel a lot easier typing up an email to someone and being like, hey, I'm a producer in this department, but I really want to learn about your department and I'm really interested in working there. Would you like to meet with me? Instead of just like randomly emailing someone from my Gmail and being like, hi. Um, So that's like, I think the benefit of working for a company. Also like, at least here at PBS, people want to connect you like, People know I don't want to just do promo. So I have like, we have a mentorship program and my mentor like wants to introduce me to everyone and wants to connect me and is like, always makes it a point to be like, Francesca wants to like ultimately produce documentaries here and not just do the trailers for them. Like, you know, keeping that in their mind. Um, That's great. But yeah, so just for me, I think there's benefits to both. Freelancing, you get to kind of mold your own it's like choose your own adventure, um, which can be super beneficial because you can get a wide variety of really great projects and really get great roles. But I think at least where I am in my career, I've only lived here for two years. I've only been graduated like four I um, or three, I guess. I just don't have the connections to be able to do freelance, I think, like sustainably. Although I know a ton of people who can. It took me till I was 30. So yeah, yeah, it's okay if it Um, takes some time. Which is like a lot of what I see is like, again, a lot of my senior producers who are like 40 and I've been doing this, that's all they do. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm like, I just moved here two years ago and part of it was a pandemic. So I didn't even get to like, everyone was through the computer. So um, yeah. So I guess that's my take. There's pros and cons to both. Um, I personally just like more stability. Great answer. Um, how can people connect with you, learn more about you, ask you questions, that kind of thing? Oh, uh, well, people can always ask me questions. Um, cause I love asking questions. So I also, I, I love connecting with people. Um, I would say LinkedIn probably also Instagram. I have a website. It has my phone number on it um, and my email. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, I'm super glad. The, the, I mean, the pandemic time was just kind of weird because, like, you know, no one knew what was going on. But I'm glad that we were able to connect uh, a couple weeks ago and then again today. And so yeah. just thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. And I'm, I'm super thank happy you. to see that you're, you're like, going off and killing it out there. So Oh, well, I'm trying. I mean... I think it's just making the best of it. If anyone, um, I guess I would say if anyone's like having trouble because of the pandemic, like I think we all have been through it and it doesn't last forever. Um, good things do happen when you take a leap. Um, but yeah, I'm so happy. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry if I like, talked a lot. No, it was wonderful. It was great. Uh, and we'll stay on to talk offline after I close. Yeah. Out. Okay. Yeah, but thank you so much for having me, Tyler. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals to help discover their path to success. Uh, if you have episode feedback or guest suggestions, you can email me at wecreatetruth at gmail.com. If you're listening on iTunes, please leave us a good review. Uh, you can find us on all the major podcast streaming platforms. And if you're listening, you can also watch us on YouTube. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's uh, bringing it back in 2023 and uh, big things ahead. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.